this is like one move that my grandma did, which is like the mirror. You're always like looking at him oh, back and forth. That's yeah. Like, that's like your hair chi, flipping. But yeah. You could be hair flipping too. As we ease into May, it is APAM, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It is a time for community gatherings, conversations, celebrations, and safe and loving spaces where we can bring our full, beautiful, multifaceted selves to the table. So to kick off this month's episodes, we are asking ourselves the question of what makes us Asian? Wow, that is a very short question, but a very multifaceted one, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so when we think about what it means to be Asian, this is probably a question that has come up a lot in our minds for our community, especially in the last couple of years. Beyond the surface, you know, the shape of our eyes, the color of our hair, shade of our skin, uh, maybe the fact that we speak in another language. Mm-hmm. What are the things that make us feel proud and that comfort us about our cultural identity? So this is some of the stuff that we're going to be discussing today. So to kick us off, ladies... What makes you feel Asian? I know that's a general question, but is it is there a certain reference, an experience, a moment, a person that you could think of that kind of pops into your mind when you think of this what this is what makes me feel Asian? I think for me, um, if I just go back to my earliest memories, mm-hmm. because I think growing up in my home, my first language was Mandarin, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of those years and what I was exposed to, my family experiences are automatically what I think about first within my culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think about not just my mom, dad, my sister, but my extended family. On both sides, I had cousins, and aunts and uncles that lived in the 626 area, even though I was um, out in Mission Viejo. And so I don't know, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is like my family. Family. Time mm-hmm. with family and mostly around food, as is mm-hmm. you know very traditional. <laughs> what about you, ladies? I, for me, I also think family. That is definitely a big one. And sometimes I think about how when my parents came here to the U.S., they were in their early 20s, which mm-hmm. I think was the case for a lot of our parents yeah. as well, right? I, I feel like for someone that age coming to the U.S., they there is a pressure and a need to assimilate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think for my parents, they did not really assimilate. Mm-hmm. Um, they've worked blue collar jobs since for like 30 years, they've been in the hospitality industry and like one job. And I feel like once they were able to maintain some level of financial stability and making sure that my sister and I I had a good education, they were kind of just like, okay, cool. Like that's all we need to do. Mm -hmm. So when I think about my parents, they are, I would say maybe 80 to 90% very true to their roots Mm -hmm. in terms of how they speak and the foods that they cook and their culture and their values. And then like 10% assimilated. So very traditional Chinese parents. Um, that I have. And I think one thing that they've passed down to me that I didn't really realize was a characteristic or a trait or a core value of mine is filial piety. Mm. And that that surprised me because in general, I feel like I am a pretty assertive person. Mm. But when it comes to speaking to elders, I'm actually mm. very like, ah, ah. <laughs> you like you become I mean? the opposite of almost like mm. very like just obedient kind of yes. quiet almost yeah. to a point where it's like submissive and mm. wanting to just give into certain things so that mm. you can create a harmonious environment yeah. and I saw that come out with me with like Philip's parents mm. where I'm just very like oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about though yeah, I know I'm that, that way owl. just usually so I know <laughs> yeah so that that is definitely something that I feel is for sure Asian yeah, in me yeah. like even cool. when I go to um, restaurants restaurants right and we see the the people who are serving us like i will call them like oh, liang yi, oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, which yeah. means like pretty auntie mm-hmm. like it's like the formal way to address exactly them, right? yeah. so with strangers we call them aunties or uncles even though we don't know who they are yeah, yeah. right it, at dim sum it's like it's also the respect thing where you're double tapping when someone pours you tea yeah, out of respect yeah. for them um and it's or like paying for the bills fighting for the bills these things i feel like are very much core Asian things that have been passed down to me from my very traditional Chinese parents. Oh, yeah. Actually, as you go through these things, it makes me reflect on the fact that like, I think we talked about the same thing like family, right? But a a lot of the stuff that you noted, like I remember from my childhood Mm -hmm. being very strong influences, but I would say that of my parents' generation, my aunts and uncles, they did kind of like morph a little bit over the years and Mm -hmm. our behavior started to change. So yeah, and I didn't think about that until you brought those up. I'm like, we used to be like that. And then as we got older, it kind of like changed his shift a little bit more like assimilating to American ways. Yeah, interesting. In what ways? In habits and 
in foods um, or? Yeah. You, so a small example is like, you know how it's very uh, polite and traditional that you should serve your parents when you have, when you're yes. eating together. Yes. So my parents are so like over the years, our dinners have become just kind of like your own. Sometimes you will eat whatever. Yeah. Um, sometimes you eat, we'll eat together, but we'll have like a hodgepodge of different types of foods. And now Anytime, so like because I brought home a guy, right? So yeah. you're starting to like revisit the form formalities. And if I try to serve them, I was like, "What are you doing? No, like we don't even need to do that here. It's yeah. okay, you know." Don't. Yeah. Um, but it's like, yeah. So some of those like little examples where I know growing up, I saw them do that from my grandparents, yeah. but they don't expect it anymore because they're like, "No, we're, it's okay." Don't That's so about funny that. because with Phil's parents, I always had this habit of like serving them food first, yeah. and they were just like, "Helen, you don't need to do that," because they're they're a little bit more Americanized than yeah, my parents yeah. are, and they were just like, "It's okay, we can get our own food." I'm like, "Oh, but." Weird. Like, yeah, I need yeah, to serve yeah. you, you first. Serve. You see, it's it's different for different yeah, parents, and mm. probably also what they had to go through. Whether it's like a white collar job, and then they have to like assimilate more, yeah. or for example, like even Phil's parents, like a, a white family had taken them in uh, for Thanksgiving, mm. and so I think his parents were like, "Oh, we need to also have our home look this way and uh, act right, right, in a certain right. way." So I think based on your experiences coming to the U.S., you either become more assimilated, or you just stay kind of more true to your roots and who yeah, you are, and yeah. you become comfortable. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Mel? How's Ooh. your family? Uh, my answers are different in, in a way that, like, I, when I think about what makes me Asian, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. Again, everyone have different answers and ways to think about it. But, like, I thought about memories I had growing up. Like, I just think of key moments. Like, mm. for me, it is around family. I like, think about my grandma. Like, I think about when I come back. There are moments that I'd come back from elementary school to walk back from the bus stop. And then she always knows to be peeking outside the living room door window to see if I'm come, walking back home. And then she sees me walking. I see her running out of the house with her like hair dye literally in place. And you hear this like, I guess like country or, tr or like traditional Taiwanese music blasting in the house. And I'm just like, I'll be walking with a friend. I'm like, I'm home with my grandma. <laughs> That's my <laughs> house right there. Yeah. <laughs> little things like that. Or like when my grandma would actually drop me off at the bus stop, she'll always be wearing that like some weird sleeve she, she, she got from like the markets with like a uh, big visor. visor. No, she had this like hat that literally had like, like it was like a bunny print it was like cloth covering everything so it's like oh. a visor but not as advanced <laughs> and i remember it wouldn't match her like she'll be like bright red uh, bunny yeah, print yeah. and like a green floral print for her arms and then wear a jacket underneath i'm just like hmm. and it's like <laughs> summertime but she's trying to like exactly so sun. i think these little things that you kind of just get accustomed to that you don't feel like it's asian until like you you're standing there at the bus stop with your other friends mm. parents you're like oh this is a little like different but i never I'm trying to think about that was really weird, maybe a little bit, but those are some moments. I also think about how like dinners for me, it's always revolving. Like we always had like a protein dish, vegetable mm -hmm. and a soup. Like mm -hmm. that was always a constant thing on our dinner table. Like we always had to have that. Or I think about like um, that bowl of soup, man. Right. It is the bone broth. Liquid gold for <laughs> bone broth. our parents. Yes. This is just little random things that I notice now when I go back home that that you're like, oh, this is my mom's house. Like the fact that we have a full on working washer and dryer machine or a drying machine, but we'll always hang dry our clothes. Mm -hmm. Like in the guest bedroom that I find kind of embarrassing because when you guys walk in, I'm like, here's a rack of clothes over our, our heater on the floor, but they, we could use a drying machine or we could, you know, hang in the back, but they just want to dry in the house. So like these little moments or um, that I just find like, oh, this is like, parts of it that they do little experiences that make me feel really Asian mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah oh, I have another one that just came up hmm. um hearing like the Chinese news going oh or yeah Chinese, yeah like soap operas or anything yes, yes, always yes. in the house at all times whether it's your your uh parents or your grandparents sitting in front of the tv right it's mm -hmm. always having that going yeah I would say clutter but that's a, that's a whole different <laughs> another topic I don't want to talk about um, but I think how, like you mentioned, like I did, I think feeling Asian or these experiences are kind of shaped by how you grew up, right? So mm -hmm. do you feel like your background of like where you grew up, the neighborhoods played a factor of, of how you identified as being Asian mm -hmm. or Asian American? Yeah, very much so. Um, I, I've shared on the podcast in earlier episodes before, but I grew up in Orange County mm -hmm. and there are parts of Orange County that have like Asian populations, but Mission Viejo, where I was at the time, was not one of those. Mm -hmm. um, I had some, you know, some friends who were Asian and many more that were like children of immigrants, but mm -hmm. very few like Chinese people in my schools. Um, but on the weekends, we would go out to visit my cousins at the, in the 626 area, which is like an enclave of a lot of like Asian population. Mm -hmm. So I had this weird experience of during the week days feeling out of place because I wasn't white enough mm. and then on the weekends feeling a little out of place as well because like I wasn't quite Asian American enough the way that they're mm. like the songs they were listening to the ways that they were dressing and stuff like that um and I kind of always just like 
I guess I because that's all I knew, I always just was used to feeling like different. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until going to college, because I went to a UC school, there are a lot of Asian American people that I met people like me who yeah. had that. And I was like surrounded by that. Um, so it really has been kind of like a process, I guess. Yeah. Even as recent as starting this podcast with you ladies, I feel like my relationship with my culture has shifted to become much more intimate. Mm. And when I think about my identity as a human being, I think about my culture a lot more immediately now than other mm. aspects. But yeah, it's definitely been a journey. I think we always say this, that like your relationship with your culture and your identity changes a lot. I think it's really dependent also on like who you surround yourself mm -hmm. with. And mm -hmm. I found that much later in life, I've been around Asian American people, but the first like 17 years, nope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you ladies? I know Helen had a very different experience, right? Yeah, I guess growing up uh, in the heart of Boston, oh, such good memories. But I would, I grew up with all of my cousins in one apartment building. So um, we had three, it was a three-story apartment building. I was on top floor, two of my two sets, I guess, of cousins were on the other two floors with my grandparents. Both sets of grandparents were also living there. So a lot of Asian people, a lot of Asian Chinese love, a lot of the smell of Chinese soup and yeah. incense just permeating throughout the whole building. And I was very proud. Yeah. You know, to be Asian. And I think it's not until you reach, for me, it was seventh grade that I started to see a lot of different groups of people based on ethnicities. They would start to congregate and hang out with one another. And naturally, mm -hmm. as someone who is just going with the flow of things, mm -hmm. I also happened to just, you know, find myself with more Asian friends then. So throughout high school, still feeling very proud. And it wasn't until college that my best friend and I we um we had made like this very weak pact that we would not join any of the Chinese or Asian students um associations on campus because I think when you go to college you just want to be an individual you don't mm -hmm. want to be typecasted as oh she's an Asian girl as right. part of the Asian clubs and that's all she is so we were like, let's just hang out with our floor mates. Let's hang. Let's have a very diverse group of friends. And if anything, it that was those two months was my self hating Asian phase. Mm. And come student activities day, you know, when that on campus, like all of the clubs come out and try to get you to join their club, the student, the Chinese Students Association, reach out to me, and I was like. Okay. <laughs> Broke the pack right away. And my friend wasn't even with me. And I guess someone from Asian caucus had reached out to her. And she's like, okay. So w w we ended up being the, um, the co-president. I was a co-president of the Chinese Students Association my senior year. And she was the vice president. And we just totally threw that out the window very mm -hmm. soon after. But I think something that I learned in that process is that what you are on the outside, this is you. You know, you can't wash away your Asian-ness. You're never going to feel authentic to yourself. And in those two months, I was also just like, this feels weird. Mm -hmm. So when that one person had approached me, I was like, yeah, let's try this out. And I mean, have never looked back because now we have a podcast I called know. Asian <laughs> Boss Girl. That's our name. Yeah. Have always been very proud of who I am and what I'm about, except for those two months. Mm. But it's a journey. Yeah. 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 How about for you, Mel? Again, very different from both of you or just some, I guess, overlapping moments. Um, like, like I mentioned before in the podcast, I grew up in a very Asian American suburb town. Mm. And it wasn't until I read Rise, you know, the book. Oh, you've read it? Okay, what, what, one page because my brother's... <laughs> one page of 500? Okay, sorry. My, brother, my brother's my brother been reading the book. He has sent me a screenshot. And he's like, oh, this is such an interesting fact I saw. Which one? Is that... I haven't read it yet either. <laughs> I want to say, so I grew up in Union City and Union City is in Northern California and one of the most highly populated Asian American cities in the country. So oh, that's just in for, the country? From the U.S. Based wow. on, don't call me on this. We got open up rise and double check, but I grew up in a very, very Asian suburb, mm -hmm. like Asian American. It was like a mix of different ethnic uh, backgrounds um, from the Asian diaspora. But I think growing up in that space, again, I've always been proud to be Asian, Asian American. Like I mentioned before, my mom grew up in Hawaii, which was also very Asian. Mm -hmm. So I think when she moved us over, when she moved over to California, she found out, she wanted to find a suburb that was similar to that. And I think Union City was. We were the majority. For most of my life, I've always been the majority. And, and then you went to UCSD. Which I was the majority. Yes. I didn't, I never, majority. to be honest, I actually, and this is something I feel very fortunate to have, is that I've never felt really othered. Mm. Because 
in my high school, like we, I think we were the majority, so I didn't mm-hmm. feel different. And I think everyone embraced their culture. I felt like that. Like mm-hmm. for us, like there was a VSA on campus. There was like, I remember on a, for us going to after school activities was going to get tapioca express and getting pho. Like that was mm-hmm. part of our norm, not mm-hmm. getting burgers and fries. It was like getting pho yeah. and boba, mm-hmm. you Dang. know, that was our thing. That sounds nice. It was, it was really nice. And then I, th- and I think for me, like even just the social activities, like Union City also had a very large Filipino American community. Community. Like mm-hmm. a lot of my friends were Filipino American and going to like their house parties with there's homemade pancit and lechon, you know, like I'm just so used to like being exposed to different types of Asian cultures that it was just part of my life. And I think mm-hmm. having a mom that really embraced that really helped because my mom's all my mom's coworkers, they would always do this thing where they would switch food. My mom's oh. like, my mom's like, I'll bring dumplings and you'll I'll make chow mein and they'll and then her coworker will make pancit and mm-hmm. then they'll switch mm-hmm. or her friend will make Malaysian food. So like I think just being exposed to all these different cultures at such a young age allowed for me to be so damn proud to be Asian and mm-hmm. also appreciate the other Asian cultures as well. In my house also, we spoke mostly Taiwanese Mandarin and English. So just the language is a big part of it. Everyone knows I used to go to Taiwan a lot as a child, but I think this sense of being proud of who I am translated into college um, that I think when I entered college, I was like, I am for sure going to join the Taiwanese American Club. Mm -hmm. And I sought that out. But my thing is when I when I joined, the thing I wanted to prove is that being in a cultural org is cool. And I think sometimes I had people feel like, oh, you're you're it's a cultural org. It feels kind of not as like not as close mm. as sorority or fraternity. And oh, I wanted I to see, change that perspective because I feel like, no, just because you're proud of your culture doesn't mean you're a loser or mm. mean you're a nerd. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, joining TOS was my way of being like, no, let's show like the different side of this. Yeah. And so I think for me, I will say going back to the question, yeah, my suburban, my little suburb of Union City played a huge role as to why I'm so proud. Mm. And also just also my mom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What about in the corporate world? So both of you worked mm-hmm. in corporate, Janet in the ad agency space and uh, and also in UX and then Mel in the fashion space. When you went into corporate, was there a moment where you felt acutely aware that you were Asian? So this is like a hard question to reflect on because I think we talk about this a lot where, um, especially conversations that we had over the past couple of years, where on the surface, I never felt like I was like othered. Mm. But when you think more deeply about it and you start to understand like nuanced, um, what is the word that they would use? Like just like kind of inborn bias that isn't Mm. meant, like it's maybe not the person's fault that they're being, that identifying you by their race or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It just gets so like muddy, right? Mm -hmm. And I've never had to my memory a very direct like negative experience but I will say something that did not make me feel great and I think is a very big stereotype is that you know how they say if you are an Asian woman and you work with other Asian women people will get you mixed up Mm -hmm. so I shared on one of our earlier episodes that I had a work wife at one of my UX jobs yeah and she was a great friend from college um, and we hung out with each other all the time and people would get us mixed up like Mm. they would call me Crystal they would call her Janet And sometimes we were in meetings together and like actually like presenting work. And so when people would get us mixed up, I'm like, do you actually know who's doing what? Mm. Right. And keep in mind, I'm Chinese, 100 percent Chinese. She's half Korean and half white. Mm. So it's like we don't even really like I mean, okay, fine. We both like have like somewhat Asian features, but very different features, too, and very Mm. different cultural background. But I think though there were those moments where I felt like, okay, being mixed up between each other and that is not I mean sometimes that's a problem that some women will say is due to their uh, gender as well so maybe it's like a double whammy of being Mm. both your gender and your culture um, having kind of like a not so fond experience in the corporate world Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like you guys had definitely more like I want to say intense scenarios with your identity at the workspace I think for me it's more like work was actually the first time I felt quote unquote othered because I was called out it's like oh Mel you're so Asian and I was like Mm. huh like there are moments like, you know, my excitement over food and like I would definitely be in the office like, oh, my gosh, I had to show this really cool visa video. It's K-pop. <laughs> I have no I'm, I have no shame to share it. Yeah. But yeah. my excitement over these things like K-pop or like I would bring homemade noodles to lunch and mm-hmm. like be like, oh, my God, I made this really good noodle dish or there's a really good restaurant nearby. It's like serves ramen. And like everyone's like, you're always talking about these quote unquote Asian things mm-hmm. that you're like, they, they say, oh, Mel, you're so Asian. And for me, I was like, why do you say it that way? Mm-mm. Yeah, like, is it meant to be a yeah. compliment, uh, a critique? Like, what it's, is... And it's, you know, and I'm just like, okay. You want like, some? Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, this is hella good, though. And there, there are times when people are like, oh, this is really good. Like, they only embrace my mm. sharing of my culture. But the other ones, there's always little petty girls that just make those comments. I'm just like, mm. all right. But 
And I, you're like, yeah, and what are you? Like, yeah. Actually, oh, what, like was, that makes what me... was their cultural Ooh. background? I'm curious. They're like <laughs> not Asian. <laughs> they were definitely not Asian. Um, but yeah, moments like that, I, I think it wasn't too serious for me. So mm. I was just like, all right, well, you can say what you want, but I'm hella happy about this shit. And when you watch it, you're like, damn, Black Pink is cool. I was like, yeah, it is. Mm. So I don't know. Mm. Nothing crazy. It's funny how now a lot of people adopt uh, Asian culture and yeah. listening to listen to like asian music yeah um, and it's become much more normal i, mean, I still true. remember the days when people were like oh boba what is that and now everyone drinks boba i know just right? a few years later yeah when i went into the corporate work environment i definitely knew that i was asian <laughs> like, <duh>. um, <laughs> but i kind of knew my i guess the stereotypes or what was expected of me as an mm. asian woman working in a finance job and one of the moments where it kind of hit me was more of a statistic and it's seeing that there were not a lot of Asian women at the top mm. and reading statistics. I think there was one from NBC that came out in 2022, um, which was a more recent one, but ones that said that Asian women, Asian women are well represented in corporate America. But when it comes to the position of like board of directors, mm. there's an 80% drop off, oh. which is very significant, mm. right? Very, very significant. And I knew that for me being in corporate, like that was my trajectory. Mm. That was what I had to go up against because I was Asian and a woman. And these studies are about Asian yeah. women yeah, not yeah. making as I'm like, damn, this is what I have stacked up against me. Yeah. And I think that was one of the first times where I knew like, and, and we all know, I guess not Mel because it's different, different industries are different environments, yeah. but a lot of people who were work in uh, corporate, if you're Asian woman or you're a minority, you're going to face a lot more difficulties and challenges that will hold you back from a career progression, mm. whether it's unconscious biases or discrimination or stereotyping or even cultural differences and cultural barriers that yeah. can hold you back from a career progression. So these things I was very aware of from the get go. I think it's because you both were like traditional corporate job, mm -hmm. like finance and um, advertising, advertising technology yeah. yeah oftentimes it was very male heavy and also very white yeah because mm -hmm. i think for me i worked in a female dominated fashion mm -hmm. space so mm -hmm. it was like it was a little different. bratty girls like mm. you're so asian and just like <laughs> <laughs> one of those moments. you're so not <laughs> yeah but i do feel like i feel bad like i do feel fortunate in some way that i didn't have to deal with like that intensity because I, I think i'd fall under pressure for sure mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Hi, it's Janet here. I'm gonna pull my big sister card right now and ask if you've been keeping up with your doctor visits. Even if you don't feel sick, those annual physicals are so important to keep up with. And this includes dental, eye appointments, etc. And if you're looking for a new doctor, I wanna highlight ZocDoc. It's the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. One of my favorite parts about ZocDoc are the verified patient reviews so you can see what other real humans had to say about their visit. Go to ZocDoc.com, choose a time slot and whether you want to see the doctor in person or do a video visit. Or you can book an appointment with a few taps in their app and start feeling better faster with ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc.com ABG and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot -O com slash A-B-G. ZocDoc.com slash A-V-G. Well, on a possibly lighter note, are there moments where you feel like you used to look at elder Asians and mm. think to yourself, like these, what are they doing? <laughs> like, I don't get what they're doing, whether it's like Tai Chi in the park or, uh -huh. you know, this is like one move that my grandma did, which is like the mirror. You're always like looking at your oh, hand back and forth. That's yeah. Like, I don't that's know, like that's your hair flipping. Yeah. You could be hair flipping too. But moments like that where now as an adult, you find yourself adopting some of those habits. Basically, are you becoming your parent or your grandparent, your Asian parent or grandparent? Oh, my God. It's so funny that you use Tai Chi as an example because my maternal grandfather actually practiced Tai Chi a lot. Mm. Like since I was born, I have photos of me like standing by the screen of him in the garden when I was like two years old and like in my diapers watching him. Aww. And he's like, um, but yeah, and it's 
kind of, I mean, I don't do Tai Chi, but I do yoga and I didn't make the connection until later that like there is a lot of similarity between mm. those two practices, right? It is about slow movement. It's about breathing. Um, it is about mind, body awareness and that kind of a thing. Mm. So I guess that's a little bit more of a distant link. Eugene and I also have this like running joke that when we take Toby out for walks, sometimes like especially during the wintertime, it's been really cold and I will just like pile on any random clothes. And I always go walk by the mirror on the way out and I'm like, I look like an Asian grandma, like <laughs> just like, you know, lots of like different colors and patterns. And then there's been a couple of times where we're walking and he's holding Toby and then I'm just like, I have nothing to hold on. So I'm just like walking. And he's like, you're totally, I have like my hands behind my back. I didn't realize like, oh my God, I'm totally just like strolling along and just like, you know, adopting the pose. I think the aspect of going on um, what you know, is called like sambu or like mm -hmm. going on strolls mm -hmm. or walks. I did that at a very young age with my grandma. Like she would do that every day, very early in the morning. And um, it's something that, you know, for a long time when I was in school and stuff, it didn't, you know, pick up as a habit. But on periods and breaks when I've had downtime, mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, like during the pandemic and stuff like that. Those are some habits that I started like really picking up as a mm. form of movement. And it's like, oh, I see the benefit. I see why <laughs> elder Asian people go on walks like either after dinner, or early in the That's morning. True. There's a lot yeah. of benefit to it. Fresh air. Yeah. 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 How about you ladies? For me, um, I think I told you guys this offline, but I was at Disneyland. Uh, at Disneyland, you're like, ooh, magic. Look, look at the characters. I was walking through Star Wars Land. Is that what's called? Star Wars Land? Galaxy Land? Ooh. Star Wars Land. I don't know. I can't confirm. <laughs> Galaxy's Edge. That's a that's yeah. a that's a roller coaster, right? Oh no, because I got a head, head nod. nod. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Oopsies. <laughs> Anyways, I was walking around that part of the park, and like you know, I, I I think it's really cool, like the way they designed it. But I got and I got entranced by this tree. I saw this tree and I was like, oh wow, it's like full blooming. And I just stopped there as we're walking to the freaking ride, and I was like, I need to take a picture of this tree. And after I did, I was like, holy shit, I'm fucking mom. My mom does this all the time. When she goes on walks, she goes, she'll send me photos. I was like, look at this flower on my neighborhood walk or look at this uh, plant. And I'm just like, all right. I, I never understood why like old, like our Asian elders take photos of plants. But here I am at Disneyland looking at this Taking damn tree. <laughs> and these little moments of like, am I just stopping to appreciate the nature's beauty? Mm -hmm. Now that's kind of nice, you know? But other things I find myself doing is like, I don't know if this is like random, but I used to love cold, cold water. Like, I'm mm. an ice water type of gal. Lately, I've been drinking hot water, like, every, mm. all the time. Like, I went to hot yoga with Janet, and I brought my hot water. I was like, this is the worst <laughs> idea ever. I was like, why did I bring this hot water? But just drinking warm water, because I feel like when I was really young, all your Asian elders, like, don't tap water, drink it warm. It's good. It's better for your body. Yeah. Didn't start doing that until probably this year. Mm. So these little things, I'm just, like, trying to, like, learn, and, like, I'm starting to adapt. Even the fact that now I want to make more bone broth. Mm -hmm. Like, my mom's, like bone broth um, soup with uh, with ginger. I'm like, always ask, I'm calling her and saying, how do you make this dish? How do you make that mm -hmm. soup? Like asking of her advice. So those are little moments I feel like I'm turning into my mother. I'm actually wearing my grandma's top right now. So I guess I'm turning Aww. to my grandma as well. <laughs> this is my grandma. She got it from a... a Tai Su Hang, which is like a market, daytime market in Taiwan. And if you don't know what we're talking about, we are on YouTube. Yes. So you can go on the YouTube and see and this. Take a look at check it out. My, my sure. summertime shirt or something I'm wearing in the wintertime. But I guess the last thing I say that I do is whenever I get plastic bags now, which is very rare, I will fold them in a certain way and then put it in my cupboard. Yeah. Will you fold them? Plastic bags? But I just like knot it. No, we fold them. Oh. So you I know Eugene does this like a, like almost origami yeah, yeah, triangle. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's what we do. So there's oh, wow. we, there's a way to fold that. plastic bags. There's yeah. different ways too. My family just yeah. we roll it, oh. knot it. That's why it's. But oh, yeah, really? yours probably a better method. Oh well, we, <laughs> my mom, my grandma didn't do it all the time. But I remember weekends we would just we would sit there with her Chinese music blasting, and we'll spend time folding all the plastic bags. Mm -hmm. So sometimes whenever I see you, when I get one, really rarely I would fold it just the way she mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. My mom actually created a system for that. I saw I it. Think you so ladies cool. saw it. It's a um it's one of those like deli takeout containers, except she cut a hole in the top and she wraps oh. it around in a circle, the the plastic bags. Yeah. So that you can pull one plastic bag out at a time. That is crazy. Like a to tissue me. box. 
Yeah, but it organizes it so well because it's all compact in there. Yeah, and yeah. then you can pull out one bag at a time. Patent That's that, next Mrs. level. Like Asian. <laughs> Patent that, Mama Wu. Yeah. We should all come over and learn how to do that. Should I make a reel for it? Yes. <laughs> should that be totally. our, our video for this episode? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, how about you? I feel like we see your mom a lot, so we could see if you're turning into her. Oh my gosh, am I? <laughs> I mean, the soup stuff for sure. Oh yeah. Well, you, I would say that like her cooking and all the soups that mm. was something that I hated growing up. Mm. That bowl of soup because I'm like I'm gonna be full after i drink the soup and then i have to eat after that yeah, yeah, yeah. so i'm very used to now downing not even those like small individual portion size bowls it's those massive bowls that oh. is my soup that i will drink before dinner and i remember the first time philip got it he was like what <laughs> <laughs> he's like is this my food or is that my food yeah, yeah. And we're like no you have to drink that f- first and leave room for food afterwards so i am very used to inhaling soup now before my food but um i do ask my mom for recipes to to make Mm -hmm. soup as well because that is something that i want to pass down to my kids and make sure that i can do for my family also i think the thing that i'm noticing now that i am a mom is that those moments where i always thought my mom was very naggy Mm. i didn't really understand why Mm. but i understand why (laughs) are you nagging your son already i think i think i will Uh, (laughs) wait why what are some moments it's just like Even now, I see myself being a little bit of a helicopter parent, hovering over him, Mm. making Mm. sure he's safe, making sure he's not falling, making sure he's not picking up stuff, putting in his mouth. Like, I'm very, I'm very hovery. And I noticed that, too. I asked Philip, I'm like, am I doing too much? And he's like, yeah, I think he's okay. And I can't tell if that's going to turn into, like, a tiger Mm. parent. So Um. I always thought that I was going to be more laissez-faire with my kid and just, you know, allow him to run around, eat dirt or whatever. But, like, I'm, I'm not... I'm not. I don't know if that's going to change mm. once his immune system gets oh, more solidified yeah, or yeah. whatever it is. But I can tell right now that I am going to be very much like, hey, make sure you wear a jacket before you leave. Make sure mm. you tell me where you're going, who you're going out with. And you just you just don't want anything bad to happen to them. Mm. Yeah. There are definitely moments where I look at him. I'm just like, this is too good to be true. And it makes Aww. me really sad to think. I'm like, it's like I catastrophize everything in my head. I'm just like, this is too good to be true. So I think I'm always just looking over him and making sure that he's safe. So I don't know. I think I am becoming my Asian mom. Okay. I, I will say that I've seen like your mom has this like really positive and like fun energy mm. with your son. And I see a lot of that in the way that you interact with him. Mm. So I think I know you're like maybe from your perspective, you're thinking of like all the times you were trying to take care of him. But when we come and we're playing with him, I see like the way that you interact with him is yeah. like very childlike energy that your mom has as well. So I was like, oh, I see that's where Helen gets it from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just hope I have the same energy as her when I'm a, a grandma one day. Yeah, she has amazing energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very warm, too. Yeah. I love your baby. <laughs> He's also just very active now, though. He's like, so how do you not active. look over him? Like, we're at the Getty. I was like, you have to keep your eyes on him. Every second. I, 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 and I feel like he was, like, touching the wall, and he was, like, touching his face. I was like, Ee! I know. You literally have to follow him every second. I remember I had one of our friends watch him for a quick moment, and he fell. And I'm just like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and remember he was like, I only turned him away once. I was like, I know. It only takes yeah. a millisecond. A millisecond, right? yeah. seriously. So thinking about our different experiences with our culture, mm-hmm. is there anything that you have always really loved and like really vibe with about the Asian culture? And what are some things or one thing that maybe when you were younger, you didn't understand or you really disliked? And then now as you're older, you're like, oh, I think I actually really appreciate that now. I'll go first. Okay. Um, something that I loved and still love is celebrating Chinese New Year. Mm-hmm. That was something that growing up, I would we would always go into Boston's Chinatown and watch the Lion dancing look at the little turtles and see all the performances <laughs> why are you laughing i had a turtle from the, the, I had a turtle the too. Oh, actually i think my eighth grade boyfriend had given that one to me and then it's arrived for many many years so wow. yeah like 13 years and those those things never survived but yeah <laughs> turtle wait what were you saying you had a turtle too yeah but not from the chinese new year festival oh anyways from where my neighbor oh. <laughs> <laughs> was it big no it's small wait okay. turtle actually has a very significant meaning in chinese culture i didn't know right? that actually Is it like long life? I think so. Yeah, because they actually, they live for a really, really long time. Mm. I want to say wiseness too, but I don't know. That seems like it would be Although my 
turtle's name was Dummy. Uh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe not wiseness. It just kept flipping over and it couldn't flip back. So in the middle of the night, it'd be like, blah, 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 and I'd go downstairs to check on it. Anyway, enough about turtles. Um, I really enjoy Chinese New Year because of like the firecrackers and the lion dances. Mm, yeah, and yeah. you know those like little poppy firecrackers? Yeah, you oh, throw yeah. Them yeah, but some people snap them in their fingers. <gasps> yeah. Do you ever see that? Yeah. You have to be yeah, like, yeah. how? What yeah. kind of callous fingers do you have? They do that and then they don't burn themselves. You have to like snap in a certain way. Oh, so no, no, no. Like, yeah, no, 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 no. never. Um, but that is something I still very much appreciate to this day, just celebrating Chinese New Year. I think the thing that I didn't appreciate at first and now I do is the Chinese tea ceremony. So, oh, yes. yes. Growing up, I saw a lot of my aunts do the Chinese tea ceremony. And I was like, oh, that's cool. But so Asian. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that in the future. Yeah, yeah. I want my white dress wedding, you know. Um, and then just a few years ago. I had my Chinese tea ceremony mm -hmm. and it was a very intimate moment between my family and Philip's family. We didn't invite friends. It was just family and Philip's parents, they don't really um, celebrate or they don't really know what Chinese tea ceremony is like mm -hmm. just because within their family, they never really did it. Mm -hmm. But the thing that they did do, which is similar to Chinese tea ceremony is pass down gold jewelry. Aww. So they had a gold necklace from like their grandparents that oh, they right. passed down to us. And I was like, Oh, save it, you know, for, for the tea ceremony because my, like we're all doing the same thing here. So it's interesting how mm -hmm. regardless of sort of like where, which part, I guess, which region mm -hmm. of China or Taiwan that you're from, it's mm -hmm. like, these are sort of things that have become custom and they yeah, might not yeah. be done in the same ceremony, but they're still kind of passed down. Yeah. 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 So that's something that I love. I love like, I love the gold, <laughs> but I love how that's a thing yeah, yeah. where you're mm. passing down, down your family heirlooms and a necklace that my mom, I saw my mom wearing this heart necklace that she wore when I was a kid, her passing that down to me in that moment. I was just like, that's so cool. Are you sure you want to give it to me? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's just going into the bank vault. I'm not holding <laughs> on to it, but for me to own that and to have that, I think it's very special and beautiful mm. and very much Chinese. Like, I can't mm. really think of in Western culture, this being a, a, a process or a ceremony or a mm. thing or that of gold is down. so valued yeah, in the way yeah, Chinese culture yeah. sees it you know so anytime I see that gold and red I'm like yo hella Asian <laughs> love it yeah. yeah that's so cool how you describe that I don't know like uh, it's so cool <laughs> <laughs> I also will appreciate like the Chinese New Year I, th I definitely think you brought that into our friend group mm -hmm. which we really appreciate because it makes me excited now to even do it myself the yeah. chinese new year dinner celebrations mm -hmm. yeah you made your own fish last time yo steamed fish that's a hard live dish to fish. prepare well yo yes. holding live fish is a freaky yeah anyways so it's spatters i i also <laughs> just there's videos of me almost lighting that kitchen on fire but oh yeah <laughs> dude, i was like shit was uh, it from uh, pouring the oil yeah. on the fish yeah it's from like the cat camera from my friend's house oh yeah, yeah. anyways um <laughs> I think for me, something I've always loved, and I don't get to do this all the time. Maybe it was Chinese near, but like when I would go back to Taiwan, I would go to my grandpa's parents' house in the countryside. Mm. And there are moments when we had dinner. And then I remember we'll cook the dinner and they go, no, 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 we have to bring it upstairs to the altar. Mm. And I go, oh. Mm. And because their second floor had this room with an altar with all the ancestors and like the, you know, like all like where you in Mandarin, you bye bye, you pray. Mm -hmm. And we had to offer the food. And I always thought that was so cool. And I, I remember like when I would go, uh, when I we would stay like, we'll stay like weeks there. And I'd be like, oh, is tonight's dinner going to be bye bye or going to be altar? Mm. They go, oh, no, no, not tonight. And they're like, oh, this night is. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know why that was so cool just to see all the food laid out and knowing that after that, all my elders will like get the incense sticks and pass mm. it around. I just love the smell of those incense sticks. Mm. And so having that ceremony thing i just remembered that so much as a child so that's something i've always loved I, I still don't know what the occasion was maybe it was just like a sacred dinner i don't know mm -hmm. but another thing that we do now unfortunately it's when we go back to the cer the cemetery and pray to our ancestors yeah. we go we always make a drive out to the countryside and do it for like a few hours and we would buy the paper and you burn the paper in the um whether it's that like tra the bin the trash can yeah, thing or bin. or like Metal there's bin. there's a thing you open you put it in there yeah. I just, the smell of it is so distinct and that and the sticks again. So I just like, there's that, maybe just so traditional to me that I love mm -hmm. that this is so Asian. I love mm -hmm. being a part of, that this is part of my culture, even mm -hmm. though it's like, whether it's from celebration through or talking to your ancestors. Oh, my stomach just growled. I think that might have been bad. Yeah. These, these mics <laughs> yeah. are really good, so I probably yeah. picked it up. But I, I also, I just love those like little objects and things. For me, when we have, whenever we pray though, I always like brace myself though, because I always hear my grandpa's prayers out loud mm -hmm. he'll always say in chinese like please protect over melody yeah. da, da, da. and i'm always like <gasps> keep it in keep it in yeah but yeah. i think these little things are just so precious because it's like as someone who's kind of like i guess far removed from that 
such traditional thing, I get to see it and be a part of it yeah. and hopefully pass that. Hey, this is what something that like our family does to my kids as well. I think we are reaching an age where we do want to like remember all of this too. Because yeah. recently, for the the recent tomb sweeping day, we mm. went to the cemetery, and I was just like watching everything that because it's like things that you usually let the adults do, yeah. Right? yeah. And then you yeah. think to yourself, like one day I am going to be the adult mm. that has to do this. And there's a process mm-hmm. for it, you know, like bringing the food, pouring the the wine, and mm-hmm. making sure you're like bowing at certain times, yeah. and then the incense where you're putting it, like it's actually very meticulous yeah. yeah and i'm just like there's a lot of people bring picnics yeah, yeah. i already yeah, told yeah. philip i want a fence around my grave <laughs> 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 sorry like you go all out these days at the yeah. cemetery i'm like i'm gonna create a pinterest board for you <laughs> people actually do <laughs> like cemetery. when i would visit my grandparents we would see during like the holidays people will decorate the graves mm-hmm. for like halloween sometimes for christmas oh, wow. all these things yeah. um and it was a cemetery that was big in the like asian community mm. so you i think there is a lot in the Asian culture of spending time and appreciating your ancestors yeah. and your yeah. elders, those mm-hmm. who've passed on. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. Oh, for the thing that yeah, you asked about, like what is something I didn't appreciate as, as when I was younger, but now I do. Oddly enough, I think when I was younger, whenever we would go out to dinner, my mom said, let's go to this Chinese restaurant. I was like, why are those Chinese restaurants for dinner when we go out? Like, why can't we go to like hometown buffet or like- Yeah, I relate like, to that. Like Chili's, <laughs> like we did go to that, but I'm like, they're always, I was like, what do you want? Like Chinese food. I'm like, ugh, yep. I don't want it. But yep. now when I go back home, my mom's like, what do you want to eat? I go, I, I, I want to eat Chinese food. Like, yeah. I just want to yeah, go to yeah. a Chinese restaurant, eat the food. Like, I don't know. Like, I want to see the Lazy Susan. I want to have the tea. I want to have the whole thing. And so, like, I always ask for Chinese restaurants now versus, mm. like, I don't know, Texas Roadhouse or something. Yeah. yeah, Oof, yeah. But I love I the know the Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> we do go there, but I'm just like, Chinese Oof. food, please. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, how about you? I had the same experience with a lot of my cousins growing up. We would always be like, oh, Chinese again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but funny funny enough, even though I maybe didn't like love the or like bond with the food when I was younger, the imagery and the experience of sitting around a round table mm-hmm. with your family. Because think about what other cultures do they sit around in a round table, right? Most places I feel like more most tradition, it's like square tables that you sit with families. Or maybe I'm just like thinking. <laughs> hmm. But like the or the way that we eat where it's like family style and the lazy Susan. I think just that whole experience mm, it, just yeah, yeah. Like, it just feels like it just feels like what do tables look like at restaurants <laughs> yeah. but i mean i think it's the aspect of no matter how many people are in your party you get the like equal opportunity to see everyone's face equal right opportunity yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so i just thought that i'm like mm, yeah but that is something ever since i was little i just loved um, like the experience of that because mm. it's never quiet, right? People are always oh, talking yeah, because yeah. you're always looking at all these people That's and true. there's always food coming out and there's always always someone is like spinning and either grabbing something or putting something back and mm. around. So I just That's remember true. being, even as like a young child, um, my dad would go out, you know, every weekend, sometimes for family, sometimes I have dinner with like friends or lunch or dim sum. And there was always, it got to a point sometimes where he's like, maybe I'll go, like if you want to come, you don't have to. And I was always like, yeah, I want to come. Yeah, even yeah. if I like didn't know the people, I think just it felt like a lively experience. Mm, mm-hmm. In terms of something that I didn't really appreciate, I think especially growing up in a in, in a community that, you know, was did not have a lot of Asian people, language for me was one of the biggest things that would mm. give you away as being different, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I remember oftentimes being so embarrassed if my parents are like speaking Chinese when they're picking me up from school or something like that. Mm. Um, and really like trying to adopt like the American language. And uh, now that I'm older, I have such like regret for not like I want to hear it more and I mm. want to like learn it more. And our family kind of just I think just because of me and my sister going to school and then using like the English language more than especially when my grandparents like stopped living with us, like slowly my parents also then transitioned to doing just like listening in English and understanding and then responding in Chinese. Mm. So I think language is something for me that really shifted my perspective. And mm. I will say for anyone out there listening who's like a younger person, really, really appreciate and try to learn the language because you will I feel like you'll you'll feel mm-hmm. differently about it when you're older. So is there something about our culture that you feel very confident about and you feel like super well-versed in? I don't know if I'm super confident, but I guess maybe because you guys have both, you have said it to me. I actually feel pretty well-versed in language. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're the most fluent. Well, actually, Helen. Helen's pretty good. Yeah, you can't yeah, tell. Yeah. That's true. I don't say, <laughs> I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't, yeah, it's true. You're very uh, fluent though. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because of growing up, I was raised by my grandparents and they always spoke Mandarin and I not only do I can speak Mandarin, I'm not the best, but I could, I'll understand Taiwanese fluently. Like in my household, the first language that is spoken is Taiwanese, like mm-hmm. Mandarin second and then English. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think as growing up also spending the time with my grandparents, I spent a lot of time with their friends. So oh. my first friends were elders. So I had to communicate with them in Mandarin. So I, I think I feel confident enough to have a conversation 
might be kind of broken. But I can some I can navigate being in Taiwan by myself and feel mm. fine. I think for me, I'm also just fascinated with language. I love mm. hearing Korean, Japanese. Like I just think it's really f- like, nice to hear in the ears. Um, I guess the second thing I I feel again because being with my grandparents, I feel like it's easier for me to bond with like elders oh, in my family. Like I don't feel awkward around old people or like. <laughs> You know, sometimes you feel like, like being around adults, being around you feel adults like, you're like, oh, I have to be really formal like, or like, I don't yeah, know how to relate to them. Yeah, because yes. I would. Well, Janice, not either. Last episode, we found out that she had an elder. That's true. Co-worker, <laughs> a BFF. So, yeah. But I yeah. feel like around like Asian elders, I think because of the cultural yeah. thing, I don't know. It's like I feel like nervous yeah. and I don't know like if I'm doing the right things yeah, or saying yeah, the right yeah. things. You don't want to offend. You want to yeah. make sure you're being polite. Yeah, I think there's. Maybe I'm also coming off too friendly. I mean, you could tell me. I, I always talk to your mom and Phil's mom. That I'm they, always no, they love it. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm it's always, really. I'm always like, I just let her, let her take the lead. I'm in the yeah. background, like, mm-hmm. yeah, like anyhow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's. I think it, yeah, it's just being around a lot of like elders growing up mm. and having to like. I didn't have any kids. Like I was only child, so I had no other kids. Like, oh, want to play dolls? Mm-hmm. No, I had to like talk mm-hmm. with them. It's mm. like, okay, cool. So I think bonding with elders and like family members and then speaking the language. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. Those are those are the ones I would say for you as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say for me, the one thing I can think of where I've like used my Chinese-ness um, in a way that benefit my friends is ordering dim sum. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Because my, my family loves dim sum. We used to go to dim sum every single Sunday. And yeah, I mean, this shit's good. The ha gao, the gao chur, mm, so so. Yeah. We actually have not really. And I know we need to do that. Yeah, yeah. But being able to order is clutch because you get a little more like ooh, ooh like mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. And dim sum is one of those experiences where you have to order throughout the entire meal, ex- almost mm-hmm. right. Like versus yeah. like going to a restaurant and you only need that skill like one time. Yeah, yeah. But it's you like can, you're constantly. You can also look at the things and point at it, but it's more efficient if you're just yeah, like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. yeah. And they feel more <laughs> comfortable also if you could speak the language with them. I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, a lot of Chinatowns, the workers there do speak Toysonese mm. so I don't know if people out there know but if you're speaking to your the server usually they'll speak to you in Cantonese first but then if you bring out the, the Hoisan Wa they actually their native tongue is Hoisan Wa ah. a lot of like central like Chinatowns hmm. metropolitan Chinatowns have people who speak Hoisan Wa cool. mm. and I think they they get a little happy too they're like mm. ooh okay oh. Hoisan Wa Nui <laughs> like, oh, yeah that's me but yeah dim some ordering that's it <laughs> So I had a really hard time answering this because I'm not really confident about much of my skills with my cultural aspects. But the one thing that did come to mind is um, Baijiu. Do you enjoy know that? <laughs> Sorry, that's gross. It is a Chinese clear liquor. Oh, and I say it because it's like known to be like battery acid, right? But I've had I've gone to Taiwan and my dad's um, really good friends uh, and his wife they took us out to dinner and as part of the, like the couple courses of meals you have to drink it with like every course so now I feel confident that I can at least take down a shot because it's like even among like my cousins we're always like if our parents are drinking it it's like oh my god you can't it smells so strong because so like typical liquor is like forty percent alcohol right Baijiu will be forty to sixty percent so it's a lot stronger mm. and it's a lot like it's just smells. Very, very potent. <laughs> so, okay, bring it to our next hangout. I'm actually curious now. Oh, oh gosh. No, no, Okay, no. yeah, actually, right. if Janet, I tell my dad, he'll get super excited. We're going to find collection. something <laughs> that you're more skilled at than that. I know. Because I'm sure there is something other than you taking a shot of Baijo. Okay. <laughs> All right, so to wrap up this episode and this segment, can you do a quick fire round of name three things that you feel are very Asian? Okay, let's just shout them out because I okay. can't think of three in the row right now. Okay. Boba. For, uh, boba, oh, yes. Um, Slippers in the house. Yes, scrambling tiles, mahjong set tiles. Ooh. The sound of that. It's an ASMR experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uniqlo puffer jackets. Oh, yes. Ooh. Uh, peeled oranges. Ooh. Uh, desserts that are not too sweet. Uh, the medicine that you eat for your stomach that has 50 pills and you're like, what the fuck? I'm eating yeah. 50 pills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, uh, the red blanket that's like hella fuck thick. <gasps> A thick. Thick. It's hella thick. <laughs> with like floral thick. designs on it. I know you're talking about, yeah. and I have that too at Ooh, home. Cooking with chopsticks. Oh. oh. No. <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> not leaving your chopsticks stuck uh, up on your rice. Always flat. Oh, yes. This is really random, but like Paris baguette on the weekends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or no, afternoons. I always see, or like, I always, this is really random, but I always find it really sweet when I'm going, I go to a group, the Korean grocery market, but seeing like the, like, the older like generation having coffee and they're always enjoying themselves. Yeah, I'm just yeah, like, yeah. that is, the and they're all Asian. Thing. So I was always think about that. I mean, that's more of a California thing. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, Eugene and I do that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we are those people. Um, um, visors, floral, anything. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> this. Oh. The mom perm. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Mismatched bed sheets. Mm. They don't, when I go home, I'm like, what is this? Tattered clothes. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
<laughs> okay, I just think about like my grandma. Like she always her clothes are always oh yeah. There's like there's like a, a pin or something that's always holding, holding together, together some Aww. hole. I'm like, let me give you another vest, and she's like, no, this they still works. It. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. So always expired food in the fridge. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, this is getting... I'm not gonna claim that one. Because <laughs> no, sometimes when I go back home, I was like, "Oh, I'll use this oh, must- I see this mustard yeah, yeah, bottle yeah. that expired ten years ago. Yes. It's still in the refrigerator." They're like, "It's ago. a recommendation, not maybe, a maybe hard. It's my mom." <laughs> Clutter. Period. Soup. Mm. Mm. There has to be more. Sal- yeah, I mean, Salon pas. Salon pas. Oh yeah, she tiger tiger, tiger bomb. bomb. Oh, but tiger in the bomb. Form of the yeah yeah yes. I'm like literally thinking about my mom, and my dad. I know. I was like, "What's dude? That's really Asian." Toothpicks. Oh, oh yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> I'm always like, oh man. Pocky six and white rabbit candy that is soft, mm. not hard because it can break your teeth. Oh. What is that container that you get from Costco? The cookies, but it becomes like your th- your sewing the blue ones. Yeah, uh, I have yeah, those. Yeah. Danish cookies. Danish cookies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I was like, I was like, hmm. There's more, but it sounds. There's mm. so much more. There's so much. There's more. so much more. Yeah. Leave them in the comments for us so we can keep. Yeah. What is it? Just, list ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. I think it's always fun for us to reflect back on our identity. I feel like it's such a nuanced thing. It's constantly evolving. But to just think about, I guess, like where we start in our foundation of mm. how do we start forming this? How do we end up here? <laughs> yeah exactly what was the start of all that but thank you for letting us have some time to think about this i think identity is so important and i find it really valuable just to think about these things um because it shapes who you are but yeah let us know in the comments on our latest instagram post or in this youtube video what makes you feel super asian we want to hear from you and you can catch us on all of the socials at asian boss girl you can listen to us on all the podcasting platforms and if you are not listening or watching yet we are also on the youtubes we also have a discord channel join our community we have a community of four thousand plus strong Whoa. so come on over and join us over there and with that we will catch you all on the next episode bye